All right, let's talk about uh, the application of actual administration. You know, we've given a lot of uh, examples of where you need to be aware of administration, we've given a lot of uh, things that you need to be considering in administration. We've talked a bit about structure and how that can be applied uh, for helping you to grow and helping you to uh, move forward. You know, the difference between a growth structure versus a maintenance structure. Uh, but one of the other things that we can talk about is how administration can actually apply in the context of a local church. So let's talk a little bit about uh, church administration and follow-up systems. Uh, administration involves many functions and responsibilities, all designated to fulfill the mission of the church and to promote growth. Now remember what we talked about earlier is that the church does what it is, organizes what it does. Um, automation in the church or structures and systems in the church uh, is essential today. A church must be structured to maintain many small groups and their ministries. Uh, it's not just going to necessarily be one big conglomerate. It's going to need to be uh, cells of organized structure to help facilitate growth. And here's the challenge that we have in um, some organizations is that when you have one person who's the hub without the appropriate leadership and division of duties, uh, it only will grow to the point that that individual can handle. That's why delegation and structure is so important. So an example of the administration challenge is to keep up with people and prevent them from dropping out because they feel disconnected. So that's the, the conversation that we're talking about with follow-up systems. Follow-up procedures for prospective members are vital. Okay? So this is just a practical example of administrative needs, administrative application. So here's the reality that we're faced with in um, church attendance. 85% 85 visitor, 85 of visitors contacted within 36 hours return. 85% of visitors contacted within 36 hours return. So what systems do you have in place to help with that? For us, we've actually structured it so at, at Bethel, we've actually structured it. We have an employee that works on Sundays from 11 to 7 or something, 11 to 8, something, where their job is to enter in all the first-time visitor information. And then they assign those contacts out to the pastoral staff for making phone calls. The phone calls are to be completed within 24 hours, so i.e. by Monday, uh, for contact. 60% of visitors contacted within 72 hours return. So uh, you see, quick is a good answer. Quick is a good answer. Initial contacts made by volunteers are twice as effective as those made by paid staff members. So one of the things that we've actually discussed doing is having, uh, we, do, we do cookie visits for our third time visitors. We, the pastoral staff will deliver cookies to their house. Yeah, it's fun, isn't it? Um, we're actually discussing having that done for first time guests and sending out teams of volunteers to do it, to connect with them. So, but it's, it's, it's creating a system for follow-up. How many churches never even considered? That they're like, oh, we got a visitor that was here this past. See, this is the challenge of a smaller setting. If you have like one guest a week, you don't really have necessity to create a system. It's just pretty much, ah, you know, we should call that person that came on Sunday. But if you're a larger church and you want to continue to grow, then you need to establish a system. And if you do what you need to do while you're small in order to grow, it becomes easier to grow. So uh, initial contacts may be Usually it takes six to 10 contacts before prospects join the church. Generally, this also includes attending three to four worship services. Here's the thing that we recognize. We even, we even structure our service to encourage people to fill out the connection card with us. We'll say it three times at least before the end of the day. We welcome guests. We point out the connection card is in the worship folder. Then it is in the announcements or in the videos. And then Pastor Glenn mentions it one more time. And we have somebody out in the forward. Why do we do that? So that people know we've got a way to gather information and a way to connect with you as a visitor. It's a system that we have established to help people know how to get connected. I am of the opinion that by the time people fill out the first time guest card, they've probably been here at least twice at least. Um, because if you're like me, I'm not filling out a guest card the first time I go to the first time I go someplace. Um, my wife will, because they ask her to. Heather is very much of a rules-oriented person, so if they ask her to fill out a guest card, she will. Um, I will not. 
And she paid the price for that because we visited a church one time in California when we were on vacation, and they asked her to fill out a guest card, and I'm like, we're not coming back. So, but she did, and it took her three years to get off their email list. So, 75% of new members retain their active participation one year later if they were quickly assimilated into a small group, uh, choir, or ministry opportunity, those kind of things. So, what does that say? You need to have a system for moving somebody. You know, Rick Warren describes it. You know, he's got concentric circles, right? So you've got you got these people out here, which are the crowd. Then you've got maybe I've got one too many. You got your crowd. Oh no, it's not. You got your crowd, your congregation, your committed. And then your core. Those are on the it's purpose driven life. This is the same. So, what do we need as a church? You need a system that moves somebody from the crowd to the congregation. So, this is somebody that came once or twice. How do you get them to become a regular attender? How do you get them to go from being a regular attender to being an involved member? And then, how do you get them to go from being involved to being a leader? These are systems of automation, these are systems of follow up. So, 15% uh, of the church income should finance outreach, which means this right here, this crowd, what's the system that you're committing to that? To get them to come in, to get them to follow through. We actually probably do, I would say, we're probably a little higher when you include promotion. You know, we, we do a lot of mail outs, especially when we talk about Easter. Easter and uh, Christmas, um, we are a small direct mail organization. Um, Easter, we sent out 75,000 postcards um, for Easter alone, not including what we sent internally. So actually, at Easter, we sent closer to 85,000 postcards. Uh, and we, we flyered everywhere. And we had, you guys put posters everywhere. Um, yeah. Eight out of ten, eight of ten people joining the church first came as the result of a small group activity, uh, Bible studies, sports, etc. So, you know, when we, when, when we consider, when we consider what we do, uh, this is something that's important to understand, that the structure of our small groups. So let's say somebody comes to a small group. We have our Wednesday night small group classes that we're teaching right now at Park Deeper. Let's say maybe somebody comes. It's the first time they've ever come to the church. How do we get them from here to here? Well, do we have a mechanism for capturing their information? Do we have a mechanism for following up with them? Do we have a way of uh, knowing and then communicating with them? That's a question, that's a good question. Uh, so these are things to consider, and these are the things that a lot of churches don't consider. They actually, um, they have a guest come in, and they either, depending on the nature of the church, they either ignore them completely. Have you ever visited a church like that? Where first time guests are not even acknowledged. I mean, now I'm not talking about like the pulpit one, would you have this your first time here, please stand up, which I will never do. Oh man, I tell you what, my, my folks home church, my parents home church, um, we're only there like once a year, okay? And um, it, it's only 100 people, 125 people. So they know when there's a guest there, but they don't acknowledge it at all. They don't recognize it at all. And it, it's just, it's crazy. It's crazy. For every 100 members, there should be 100 prospects. So, these are things that you need to be thinking through for opportunities to create application of systems. For every 100 members, there should be 100 prospects. How do you develop a prospect in a church? Well, we use invite cards. We do invite campaigns. We do the, the follow-up that we do with guests and, uh, guests and uh, salvations and baptisms. That's all part of developing our prospects. Now, growing churches have a ratio of 225 prospects for every 100 members. One of the things that we're looking at doing is capturing the information for people that, knew, that newly moved into the area. There's companies that will provide the direct mail marketing information for you. But most churches, they, um, they're not interested in pursuing active growth. They want it to happen, just happen, happen. And that's why I think a lot of churches are um, declining. A church will not grow beyond its ability to care for its people and involve them in productive ministry. So 
This is the system we're talking about to follow. How do we move them from the crowd of the congregation to the core? How do we move them? Do we have ways and opportunities for them to get involved? So we talk about it in volunteering in this sense. We talk about it in volunteering. Um, we have, for getting involved, we call them first serve opportunities. First serve opportunity. Good example of a first serve opportunity. A greeter at a door. You know what training it takes to become a greeter? None. Just say hi to people like that. Hi. It's the way you say hi. Uh -huh. sure. So it's 12 <laughs> seconds of training. Say hi, happy. There you go. Um, but you know what? Greeting, uh, the, the, the greeter, you know who the best people to put at greeters are? The outgoing Okay, that's, that's one answer. Friendly people. Good looking people. Ah, good looking people. Don't put the ugly people out there. That's right. That's good. <laughs> what? Oh my gosh, would you even do that? No. You know, you know who the best people to put out there are? New people. New people. Do you know why? Because they don't know anyone. So they're going to greet everybody. Whereas people that have been there for a while, who are they going to greet? People, people that know. know. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah, put new people out there. There's a story, um, again, using Phoenix First. Phoenix First was famous for putting people into ministry like minutes after they were saved. Um, so they, there's a um, couple of strippers that came to the church first service, got saved, and they were greeting at the door second service. Yeah. So there you go. That's quick assimilation. You know, what, what training do you need to be a greeter? Say hi to everybody as they come in. It's a popular door. But it's one of those things that we sometimes make it hard to get involved. But first serve opportunities, what does that do? It helps somebody move from the crowd to the congregation to the committed to the core by giving them an opportunity to serve. Listen, it's a first serve opportunity. Greeter at the door. Absolutely. Count team for the offering. Absolutely not. You should know those people before they count money. Teaching a children's church class. Nope, not a first serve opportunity. Helping in a class. Absolutely, that's good. Helping in the bank, we, you know, we ever do that. Or check it, those are great opportunities. Those are, those are easy places to get people involved. And as we start developing systems, we have to have systems that run congruent with each other. So they have to run parallel. How do you, how do you follow up with a first time guest? How do you make them aware of ways they can get connected? How do you encourage them to start becoming a giver? How do you encourage them to start serving? These are all running at the same time, hoping to move them towards the center. And then let's say once somebody becomes a committed member where they're serving in ministry, how do they move to a core leadership position? Is that, is that reserved for a select few? Or is there opportunities for, I, I, I have started in children's ministry, we, get, we do a leadership thing about six times a year, um, and whoever wants to come can be a part of it. It's just leadership training. I, I, that's all I do. I just I, I talk about what it means to be a leader. Right now, we're dealing with the first element of redemptive leadership. Does anybody remember what the first element of redemptive leadership is? Jesus. No. It's the only element. Come on, you guys taking Christian leadership, haven't you? Why? <laughs> haven't you? You taking Christian leadership, Kayla? Mm -hmm. What was the first leadership core belief? That was like a module in class. I can't remember. Yes, sir. <laughs> it, it, I just remember redemptive leadership. So I did. I did my paper on that one. So hurtful. So hurtful. Michael Knapp, you've been in the class. Yeah, it was Twelve years. Yeah, it was like two years ago. But I changed since then. Andy Pearl, you Sandra, I know you haven't been in it since I've taught it. The heart of the leader directly impacts his or her ability to lead. That's the mm -hmm. one. Thanks. Thanks for confirming. <laughs> thanks for confirming. Well, Jesus would be in that heart. I do believe It's a core leadership belief. Jesus, Jesus would be in their heart. Thank you, Mike. Oh, you're talking the stages, yeah, uh, the, the five, the five stages of redemptive leadership. No, the core, the heart of the leader directly uh, impacts his or her ability to lead. That's what I've been teaching in our, our leadership stuff for children's ministry now for the last. I started in March, six months, seven months. Do you have to be something special to be in that leadership? No. Why? Why am I doing it? To help move them to the core of leadership. 
to help move them that way. You have to have systems in place in order to move people from the crowd to the congregation to the committed to the core. Uh, these are things. And so when we talk about these statistics of people getting involved, these are things where you have the opportunity to apply systems. So I'll give you an example that we talk about here. First time guests. Um, well, my handwriting's atrocious, so you guys don't want to see it anyway. First time guests um, call within 24 hours. On Sunday, once they're entered in, um, a letter is printed that Pastor Glenn signs on Monday morning, so it goes out Monday, uh, welcoming them, thanking them, inviting them back. Uh, there's an email that goes out to them on Sunday, thanking them for attending, that invites them to fill out a survey that uh, reflects on why they enjoyed the service or didn't enjoy the service. There's a text message that goes out before 4 o'clock that same day, thanking them for coming. Let me, please let us know if there's anything we can pray with you about. So we got, within 24 hours, they've gotten a text message, an email, a letter, and a phone call for one person. Now, there's a system. There's a system in place. We're talking about ways to deepen that system so that what, what, what if they don't come back the next week? How do we follow up with them? What if they don't come back after three weeks? One of the things that we've instituted in children's ministry is if um, a child does not attend for three consecutive weeks, we send them a postcard telling them we miss them. Why? Because we want them to come back. It's actually, if they haven't attended three times, three times consecutively or five times in six weeks. It's, it's, I, I've got it specified that way. So that way we can follow up on them and just because let's let's say you only did you only ran that once a month. Say if they haven't attended in a month, then we send them a card. Here's the problem with that system. Let's say they attend the first week of August. So when you run your report at the end of August, well they've been here. When you run your report again at the end of September, they haven't been there in seven weeks. So that's why when you do your systems. Make sure you're evaluating and measuring the right things. Because the difference between every three weeks versus they've attended within this month can be the difference between they're contacted within three weeks or they're contacted within seven or eight. So what are the systems that you need to be in place to help close the back door? How do you, how do you stop people from leaving just from leaving? How do you help retain guests? How do you follow up with salvations? How do you encourage people to get baptized? How do you encourage them to start giving? These are all systems of administration that need to be considered within the local church context, all for the same purpose that we started with, to help fulfill the task and mission of the church. It's not just about getting more people in the building. It's about connecting and caring for people and letting them know they're important. These are all systems of connection, not because you just need them at your church, because you want them to know that they matter to you because they matter to God. That's why when we talk about administration, we need to keep it people-centered so that we're making decisions that are in the best interest of connecting people to the church. Does that make sense? Good. Any questions?